welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Hello and welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your weekly home for all things related to helping you on your journey to finding that amazing job. Each week I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, entrepreneurs, coaches and bloggers who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute show. Put simply, this is a show which I had a decade ago when I graduated. For episode 34 of the Graduate Job Podcast, we have for the first time a BAFTA award winner on the show, the absolutely fascinating Jeff Thompson. We go deep this week as Jeff and I delve into the topic of fear and how it might be holding you back in your job search. Now what fears are holding you back from getting that graduate job? What stories are you telling yourself which are stopping you from applying to the job of your dreams? It's a captivating episode and it's one you're going to want to listen to more than once. As always, all links to everything we discuss and a full transcript are available in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash fear. But before we start, don't forget, I love to hear your feedback, so do get in touch either by email or Twitter. On Twitter, I'm at gradjobpodcast. An email is hello at graduatejobpodcast.com. Let me know what you love, people or companies you'd like to see in the show. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so send everything my way. But now, without further ado, let's push straight on with episode 34. We have a very special guest today, former nightclub bouncer turned martial art instructor, prolific and best-selling author, and BAFTA award-winning screenwriter. Jeff Thompson, a very warm welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me on. And today, the topic we're going to cover is one which I think is massively important in people's job search and plays a large part with respect to the companies or industries that people apply to or might not apply to, as the case may be, but also a topic which is never really discussed in this context, and that is one of fear. And today, we're going to explore thoughts around fear and what it might be that's holding you back. So to start with, Jeff, I mentioned you've been on an amazing journey from nightclub bouncer to BAFTA award-winning screenwriter. Could you tell us, by way of introduction, how you came to make this transition, as know that your thoughts on fear played an important part in this? Mm. Now, when I was younger, I had a huge ambition, you know, to live on the to live on the very dangerous edge and to to experience life in all of its delicious extremes. I, I was really excited by the idea of, you know, this limitless reality, um, and it was always within my reach, but kind of seemed tantalisingly be, just beyond my grasp. I could never get hold of it. Um, standing between me and you know my dreams was this line of fear. That's what I recognised. I was just afraid. Um, so I decided to go out, and you know this was after you know this was after um, kind of a, a long period of you know failed starts, wanting to live authentically but not able to live authentically because it was too much fear. The fear kind of forced me to retreat and shrink and actually feel ashamed of my ambitions. Um, and that left me, you know, with massive depression, actually, because I had no outlet for this massive ambition, this excitement for life. Uh, so I find myself waking up at four in the morning, cold with sweat, my wife in bed next to me asleep, my kids in the other room also asleep, um, in, a, in a house full of people, but completely alone. Um, and I did what most people do when they're, you know, when, when fear hits them, I, I kind of went out into the world for answers. I looked specific, specifically in books, but the books that promised to give me answers, you know, they didn't. It, either the authors didn't know the answers or they were too afraid to put them on the page of a book, you know. Um, and then at one point, I just thought, I, I would just get so depressed uh, and so down about not living an authentic life. I just thought, I'm going to do something about this. I'm, I, I got angry, actually. I was I was fed up of uh, feeling afraid all the time. So I thought, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write everything down that I'm afraid of I'm, and I'm going to confront all of my fears one at a time. So basically, I, I drew a pyramid on a piece of paper and I wrote all my fears down in ascending order, least fear on the bottom step, worst fear on the top step, and I systematically started to confront my fears one at a time until I reached the peak. And that's what I did. But the interesting thing was, as I started to write the fears down, and of course the first fear, the main fear, was that I was afraid to admit that I was afraid. Isn't that strange? It's very mm. delicious, of the denial. I was afraid to admit that I was afraid. Because um, if I admitted that I was afraid, I, I thought I might look weak. 
And if I admitted that I was afraid, it meant I'd have to do something about it. And that really terrified me. So writing down the first fear, which is the fear of, you know, this fear of admitting that I was afraid, was my first fear overcome right there. So I started to confront my fears one by one, systematically. Um, and each time I overcame a fear, um, you know, I, I grew in strength, I grew in experience, you know, I grew in wisdom. Um, when I got rid of a fear, when it dissolved, it created a vacuum in me, and that vacuum was filled with courage. But an interesting thing happened. As I was climbing the pyramid of fears, um, other more subtle fears started to appear, um, almost as though the mundane fears were like layers or covers that were um, sitting over the top of the things I was really afraid of. I was afraid of, for instance, I was afraid of my potential. Definitely, I was afraid of success. I know that might sound strange, but, you know, success meant change. And, I was, and you know, that change might be the only constant, but it's the one thing everyone's afraid of. If I was successful, how would that affect my wife? How would that affect my children? How would that affect my friends if I suddenly went from being Jeff, you know, the, the factory worker to Jeff the, night, you know, Jeff the nightclub bouncer or Jeff the published author? appearing on daytime TV with Richard and Julie. Judy. So I was afraid of my own success, so a fear of success went on the list. Then I realised I was afraid of my wife. Um, and she was a good girl, you know, but I was afraid of her. I'd, I'd allowed her to bully me. Anything for a quiet life, that's why I kidded myself. But actually, I was afraid of her. So I was afraid of confronting her and standing up to her. So I put my wife on the list. <laughs> my first wife. Um, and I also realised I was afraid of my mum. Um, you know, I mean, I love her bones, but I was afraid of what, well, more specifically, I was afraid of her withdrawing her love. The idea of her withdrawing her love terrified me also. It's a fear of abandonment. And I think that fear of abandonment came from the fact that I was sexually abused when I was a boy. Um, and this kind of twisted, grooming man um, killed any trust I had in the world. So a fear of abandonment went on the list as well. So that's basically what I did. I just started to confront the fears. And as I confronted the fears, a strange thing happened. Every time I was able to confront fear, um, the, the nature of the fear was liberated. The effulgence, the energy that was left in the fear, transferred across to me, and I grew more courageous. And the, the higher I climbed, more courageous I became. Um, and, you know, that led me to changing jobs. That led me to eventually reaching the top of my pyramid. Um, and confronting my ultimate confrontation, which was a fear of violence. Um, and of course, I did the only thing you can do when you have a fear of violence. Um, I, took a, I, took a, I took a job as a nightclub bouncer in the most violent city in Europe, with size and population. And believe me, working in Coventry was like traversing all nine circles of the inferno. Um, and then within a very short span of time, within a decade, I guess, um, you know, I was in hundreds of fights. I, was, I witnessed violence thousands of violent situations. Four of my friends were murdered. Um, but I went from being afraid of spiders in the bath, this is how I know it works, to being able to hold my own or to stand my ground in life and death situations. Uh, so, you know, when people say, you know, we need something pragmatic, we need something that's actually going to work, me doing my fear period and confronting my fears actually worked for me. You know, it took me from being a frightened factory worker to working on the on the world stage, you know, with film and theatre and books. And one of the things I promised when I was going through this, one of the things I promised, I made a promise to myself. I said that when I find the truth, because the truth didn't seem to be available, nobody wanted to talk about fear. But I said when I find the truth, I'm going to tell people. I'm going to tell people in books and articles. I'm going to tell people in films and plays. I'm going to tell people in talks. I'm just going to tell as many people about the truth, about what I found, that what they want to do, what they want to achieve is possible. It's all possible. My life is the proof of that. You know, I, I make my living as a writer. Um, I live with the girl of my dreams. Um, I go to work in my slippers. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I am living on that dangerous edge. I am ex experiencing life in all of its delicious extremes. You know, I have, I have coffee at two in the morning with my heroes. It, so... And, and also, people actually don't do the obvious thing. They think that certain things aren't possible. This is possible for them, but it's not possible for me. You know, they have limiting beliefs, but you only have to look outside of the window at the vastness of the universe to see that anything's possible, everything's possible. But to, in order to 
um, in order for us to prove that it's possible, we have to have the courage to stand in front of the things that we're afraid to do. We have to kind of stand in that line of fear. And we have to become the proof ourselves. So that's my life is continuing, my, is continuing to do that, continuing to expand. I contract in order to expand. I contract my kind of um, egoic fears, my false ego, and I expand my conscious net. I just want to experience all of my potential. And if there's a fear standing between me and my potential, then my job is to dissolve that fear. And the way to dissolve it is to stand in front of it. Is yeah. to marinate in it, you know, to, to embrace it, to intercourse with it. Um, so from Literally. from a distance, you know, these these fears look like three dimensional monsters, but when we get closer to them, they become two dimensional cartoons, and then they dissipate. And when we embrace them, so I just encourage people to be very brave. I think it's really interesting that the the first fear that went on there was the actual putting on that you were actually scared, because yeah. just thinking to conversations with friends, I don't think. I've ever had a conversation with a friend where they've actually said to me, I'm quite scared. Yeah. As a as a bloke, it's just not something that you, you really talk about or talk about or mention. And also the you know, I can um talk about fears and, and it's strange, but before I actually emailed you, I can remember I was almost had a fear of, you know, getting in touch and reaching out. There was a little voice on my shoulder going, Oh well, you know, he's not gonna reply. Yeah, who am I? Yeah, who am I to ring to write to Jeff Thompson? Not real not right. realising that I'm just the same as you. I'm an ordinary bloke. You know, uh, and I live an extraordinary life, but that's what we were encouraging everybody to do. The good thing, the thing with fear is that, of course, it tricks people into believing that they're the only person in the world that feels this scared. Mm -hmm. I love the story of uh, Mesner, Reynold Mesner, the legendary climber, when he got stuck on the in inhospitable mountain, Langa Bat. He was uh, too afraid to go up. He was too afraid to go down. He was too afraid to stay where he was. In that, at that point on the mountain, he was afraid to live. That's what he said. I was, he was afraid to live. And when I heard that, I, I nearly cried because that was me as a young man. You know, I was afraid to live. Um, and, and what Mesner was saying to me was that fear is a part of the human condition. We all feel it. But what he encouraged me to do was to be very brave and to embrace it, to marinate in it, to intercourse with it, to go towards the thing that I was afraid of. But what he was saying was that even even legendary climbers, you know, still feel fear. I mean, he said he was on his tent on the mountain crying for his wife. But it was such a relief to me to realise that I wasn't the only person in the world that was afraid. But it encouraged me to step forward and to be brave. And it said to me, trust me, if you move forward, you know, these fears have no reality unless you give them a reality. So it's, it's, his message was go out and face your fears. And my message is exactly the same. Go out and systematically confront your fears. Collect the power. Collect the energy that's in your fears. And this is about challenging old beliefs. This is about challenging old perceptions, challenging old cognitions, you know, um, and proving that it is possible. And, of course, we know it's possible because we see other people doing it and we see the, magnific the magnificence of what is out there. But I love the idea that Mesner, is one of my heroes, was afraid. I love the idea that Christ was afraid in the garden. I love the idea that Muhammad was afraid on the pan on the mountain. I love the idea that Arjuna was afraid in the battleground. And he and, and Arjuna didn't transcend the battle from a classroom. He transcended the battle from in the battleground. So we have to be inside it. We have to have the courage to sit in it. And it, and there is nobody that it doesn't challenge. But people like me, you know, I'm I'm here to say to people what you're aiming for is possible. It's possible. It's all possible. And I'm the proof because I've gone through that door. It's not easy and it's not even probable because most people won't do it. Most people won't want to face those things. But it's possible. And I try and encourage as many people as possible to actually, you know, to look at that. You know, the people that have worked with me have suddenly doubled their income because they've gone, well, I'm going to try for that job because I didn't try for it before because I was afraid. And now I'm just going to try for it because I know I'm as good as the other guy that's doing it. The only difference between me and him is he's doing it and I'm not. And then we, we have to admire their courage for doing that. But, you know, for somebody that's not worked for a little while, or for someone that's been at home, just filling, in, just filling in an application for a job is fearful. So it's saying, you know, write all your fears down, put them on a pyramid, confront them one by one, collect your power back. It's all yours. It actually belongs to you. This is your kingdom. It's been stolen from you by perceptions that manifest themselves as fears. 
these fears can be dissolved. And when they're dissolved, it's not just that they're dissolved and that they're not there anymore, it's that you collect treasure, literally. Our soul or our, or, or our authentic self actually feeds off fear. Fear is food for the soul. So when we go towards something that we're afraid of and we face it, our authentic self grows off that. It's like, um, it's like protein powder for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's it's um, it's encouraging people just to change their perception of what fear is. It feels as though it's this three-dimensional monster. It's actually not. It's just a fuel bank. It's just an old chatter that can be converted into expendable cash. I know we're looking back at my career moves that I've made, and when I finished university, one of the there's a couple of companies that I was really interested in applying to, but never actually got around to applying to them just because my thought was well, I was scared to apply maybe even for the fear of success but I just thought oh well there's no point applying because you're not going to get in I was fancy being a spy with MI5 but never actually sent off an application because I was as you talked about limiting beliefs my limiting belief was that you know people from where I came from you know didn't work for MI5 and what's the point in even applying mm. people people fail before they even start because they have they have belief that it's not possible or certainly it's not possible for them but actually it's, it's possible for everybody. One of the big things I've learned from being exposed to consciousness and being exposed to, to the Tao or to God is that it's all possible. Everything is possible. In, in Christian theology, they call it realized eschatology. They say that everything is already yours. Everything in the universe is already yours. You've just forgotten or you've just lost, lost the access key or you've lost the code. So our job is to go towards the things that we want to achieve and recognize that they're already there, they're already ours, they're already possible. And we know they're possible because it's already been done. Other people are already doing it. And the good thing with me is I've sat with all of these people who I've thought were different from me, who have won Oscars and BAFTAs and, you know, been renowned martial artists or successful authors or millionaires or billionaires. I've sat with them. They're just the same as us. They're just people the same as us. They're just living from a different perception. I did a course once, uh, I had two people, on, there was a lot of people on the course, but there were two people that were partnered on the first day. They didn't know each other, they'd never met each other. They were both in uh, t-shirts and shorts. They both come from a similar background, working class background, and they didn't know each other. This is the first time they'd met, but I knew them both. One of them had no money, and he had very limiting beliefs, and he was only able to come on the course because his granddad had died and uh, left him some money, so we paid to come on the course. The other guy ran a company that turned over 120 million and he had a thousand people working for him. The moment this one guy on the left who believed that there was no, no, no potential, no possibilities, the government was against him, there's not enough money around, the moment he partnered with the other guy, those beliefs disappeared because he could no longer hide in those beliefs. Those beliefs were, were quite convenient, they were very subjective, but when he was suddenly working with a guy just like him in, in t-shirt and shorts, who was turning over 120 million and saying to me, I don't even feel like I'm touching the sides yet. This guy could no longer use that as an excuse because he had proof it was possible. And he couldn't even say, well, you're different because this guy wasn't different. This guy was, I've got two arms, he got two legs, and he got the same fears as everybody else. He just kept going into them. He just kept massively investing in himself. He was reading, he was learning, he was educating himself. He was continually contracting the things that stopped him from moving forward and expanding the things that did move him forward. So this guy was transformed on the first day because he goes, okay, well, at least I can see now that it's possible. Then the next job is to go, okay, it's possible for him, but is it possible for me? So then we have to start looking at why we think it's not possible for us. So if we start to imagine ourselves in that job and objections come up and fears come up and beliefs come up, our job is to just dissolve the beliefs and the fears that stand between us and the things we want to do. So there's an old, I think there's a book out called The Obstacle is the Way, but the obstacles are the way. We dissolve the obstacles that stand between subject and object, between us and the things we want to do. So um, it's all possible, um, even if it's not probable. And when I say that, that's not a negative thing. It's saying that it's possible for anybody that has the courage to stand between, to stand in front of the things uh, they're they're afraid to look at, which is the old the old limiting belief, and they call this deliberate suffering. We deliberately stand in front of the things that make us feel afraid, 
And it might just be that our background is that um, you know, we've grown up in an environment where, you know, like a tabloid environment where people kind of say, don't get above your station, don't forget where you come from, who do you think you are, don't get above yourself, you know, don't ask for too much money because what do you think we are? I think we're the Rothschilds, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. You know, be grateful with what you've got. And if you're pretentious, don't dare be pretentious because if you're pretentious and you think you're worth more than that, we'll attack you. I was with a lad the other day. He said uh, he got. He said he's just on his just doing his degree, and he got a he got a one on his he got a, a first on his degree, and he got the, the first test. He got 100% on three of his tests, and he posted it on his online to say oh, I'm really happy, and got loads of views from people saying to him, "Who do you think you are? You know, you big head, you braggart." You know, don't get above yourself. It's like, don't be excellent. My wife said to him, don't ever let anybody talk you out of being excellent. You are excellent. Be excellent. So this guy was deliberately holding himself back from his studies because he didn't want to stand out too much. I did it and I went to do a talk for university as well, James, once. And there was about 200 people in the room. And the lecturer said to the group, OK, put your hand up if you think you're if you think you're exceptional. Now, bearing in mind that this university was an exceptional university, you couldn't get into it unless you was exceptional, unless you'd done the work. Um, I think one person put his hand up and he was hesitant. He said, OK, put your hand up if you're ordinary. And nearly 200, 200 hands went up in the room, 200 people that thought they were ordinary. And they didn't think they were ordinary. They knew they weren't ordinary, but they were too, they were too afraid to stand out. They were too afraid of what people might think about them. One guy actually put his hand up and said, I think I'm below ordinary. <laughs> so that's people are afraid to say yes I'm good at this yes I have got this potential yes I can do this um, because if they do it they feel like they might be attacked but I've experienced the soul I've experienced the authentic self and it's it's vast it's vast there, there is there is nothing that will contain it. there's no limitations but that if we want if we want to exercise that authentic self in the world we need full expression and people are afraid to fully express themselves in case they get shot down and this starts with, of course, what they call the great jihad, the internal wrestle, where we go, oh, I'm going to do this. And then this voice goes, well, who do you think you are? You're not anybody. You're no good. You can't do that. You're nothing. And we believe that because we never challenge you. But that's just an old shadow. That's an old belief. So our first job is to, is to admit that we're afraid and then to challenge those fears, not just to challenge them, but to, to recognize that fear is food. When we confront those fears, when we intercourse with those fears, we're not literally when we embrace them, when we sit in the feelings, we can transform that energy in that we can we can um, liberate the fear, we can get rid of the fear, and the energy that's locked into the fear, we can gobble up. We can use it as a protein and that will expand our authentic self. And each time we do that, we become more powerful. This is what the Mexican shamans did. They would go out into the night and they would hunt down their fears because they said that um, the power was in the fear, the power was in the trauma. Uh, Rumi called it night travelling. We go out into the night and we hunt down our fears because the doorway to potential is through that. So it's kind of trying to get people to change their perception on, on their fear and just say, don't believe anything. Don't believe anything people don't tell you. Don't believe what it says on the television. Don't believe what it says. You know, the newspapers, it's hugely subjective. Challenge it. Find out for yourself. Don't just repeat what other people have told you. If you have a perception that's not possible, challenge that perception. So you talked around uh, limiting beliefs and how almost the tall poppy syndrome of people trying to bring you down. If you are surrounded with people who are telling you that you can't do things and, oh, you don't do that, you're not good enough to do that, don't apply for that job, you're not going to get it. What advice would you give to them in, in that context of how they can how they can keep on pushing themselves and going towards their fears? We have to change state. You know, we have to change frequency. You know, if I'm on if I'm on local radio, if I'm on kind of um, I don't know like a, a real local COD FM, and it's kind of an amateurish radio station, um, I can wander around that all day around that frequency. I'm not going to find radio four. I'm not going to find radio one. I have to change frequency. So changing frequency means we don't announce. To, we, we already know the people that are going to shoot us down, but we still keep announcing our plans to them in the hope that they'll support us, and then they batter us. So don't make big announcements to people. Don't show people your plans when they're in embryo. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, you, as you start to change state, as you start to challenge these old beliefs and start to go towards the things you want to succeed in and go towards your dharma, 
you will find that you just won't be in the company of these people anymore because they won't be able to breathe in your frequency. It's like a different, um, it's like a it's like a finer air. So you can you can manually start that process by um, changing what you watch on television, changing what you read in the newspapers. If you watch television and read the newspapers, you'll probably feel as though you're never going to work again, and that the sky is going to fall in any moment, or you're going to get blown up by a terrorist. Or, or someone's just going to come randomly shooting through the cinema that you're in, um, and that all of the bankers have got the money because they're greedy, and all the politicians are corrupt, um, and there is no hope. There's only the only hope is the X factor and the lottery. That's that's the, that's the kind of subjective information you're going to get if you go to the normal places of sustenance. So what we do is we start going to other places. We go to podcasts like this, and we talk to people who who have experienced truth. We buy, we invest in books, we invest in education, we invest in philosophy, or we invest in books in religion. And then we start to, we are, we'll actually start to attract different friends. We will lose old friends, and they might kick and scream as they go, but we will attract new friends. This is what, um, uh, I'm trying to think who it was, one of the great, one of the great motivational speakers anyway, um, said, go out and find others. Go out and find the others. Go and look for other people that are talking like you're talking. Like this podcast, someone's found this. Go to TED.com and listen to the thousands of speakers on there who are telling you what's possible. You know, invest in books on the internet. Build your own library. And you'll just start, you'll automatically start attracting the right people, the people that are talking the same language. They are out there, but we have to we have to find them. Although when we start talking this language, they will find us. So we also change the way we talk. Instead of saying things are difficult, things we could say that things are great, things are really challenging at the moment. We, instead of saying there's no work out there, we, we know there's work out there, and we don't even find jobs. We create jobs. People think they find jobs, but we don't. We create them. We go out and create the work. We go out and create the opportunity. So we just change the language. And a lot of this can start from reading simple books like The Elephant and the Twig. Um, there's a great book called... Um, how to Win Friends and Influence People. It's an old book. It's not a great title, but it's a fantastic book about you taking control of your own reality, you taking control of your own perceptions. And you'll just start to, you know, I mean, the people around me, are, the people that gravitate towards me are people that are in the same wavelength as me, the people that want to make films, people that want to make a difference, people that want to create change, people that want to experience life in all of its extremes. You know, I don't attract naysayers anymore because it's just not the frequency I'm in. So we have to change frequency or, or what Swedenborg called changing states. Jeff, that's, uh, that's brilliant advice. And unfortunately, time, though, is running away with us. But speaking of books, leads us nicely on to our final questions. Is there one book that you would recommend to our listeners that they should read? Um, I've just mentioned two books here, which I think The Elephant in the Twig, I think, really has a good effect on people. You can get that from Amazon or you can get it from jeffthompson.com. It's, it's a really simple motivational book with lots of pragmatic advice. There's, a, there's an old book called Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. And again, it's quite an old book now, but the message in it is very, very strong. Um, and there's quite a few current things out there, you know, like Tony Robbins, you know, Awaken the Giant Within, stuff like that. Just stuff to kickstart you. So I would say they're really good books. And there's a, I did a book as well. There's a book by Suzanne Jeffers called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, which is a great book. And I did a book called Fear the Friend of Exceptional People, which I think would really encourage people as well. Excellent. And all of those will be linked to in the show notes. So check out the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash fear, and you'll find links to everything that Jeff has discussed there. And Jeff, what one website would you recommend that listeners should go to? I would say at the moment, there's two I would say to. I would say go to TED.com, which is full of the, the most current kind of bleeding edge speakers in the world today. It's, it's a really good site for free material. And you could also go to my site, which is uh, Jeff Thompson uh, Inspired or JeffThompson.com and link the Inspired site. There's about 100 free podcasts on there about all of these kind of things. So if people are motivated by this particular talk, they can go on there. There's a, probably another 100 free talks that they can go on and, and access on jeffthompson.com. That's Jeff with a G, Thompson with a P. And I definitely recommend Jeff's podcast. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, it's really, really, really interesting every week.
And finally, Jeff, what one tip can listeners implement today to help them on their job search? Oh, there's, a great, there's a great verse in the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu, one of the big Hindu texts, and it says, lift the self, by the self. Never let the self droop down. The self is the self's only enemy. The self is the self's only friend. So it's saying that the onus is on you. You have no enemies other than the enemies you've got on yourself, your own beliefs, your own perceptions. Um, and the only friend you have is yourself. When you are balanced and aligned within yourself, you'll see that reflected in the world around you, as within, as without. Jeff, that's a brilliant, brilliant point for us to finish on. Many, many thanks for joining the Graduate Job Podcast today. It's a pleasure. Firstly, thank you to Jeff. I'm a big fan of his podcast and it was an honour to have him on mine today. As always, I've picked out three things that stood out for me. The first is on acknowledging your fears. I love Jeff's comment that fears trick you into thinking you're the only one who is afraid. As I said to Jeff, men I know aren't open to actually talking about their fears. Now that might just be my mates, but I doubt it. Have an honest conversation with yourself about what it is that you're actually scared of. Is it applying to the companies, the interviews, assessment centres, networking, getting up and doing a presentation in front of people? Is it the fear that you won't get the job? Is it the fear that you might actually get the job but then not be good at it? Or that you will get the job and you'll be amazing at it and a huge success? Now different people have different fears. The first part though is acknowledging them with yourself. Which leads me on to the second key thing for me in then having recognised fears to begin to confront them. I love Jeff's fear pyramid as a tool to record them and tick them off and the idea that fears dissolve in front of you when you confront them and then become food for your soul. I know that often when I've been fearing something and putting off, when you finally pluck up the courage to do it, you look back and wonder what all the worry was about. Protein powder for your confidence, he said. So one, recognise those fears. Two, record them and then confront them, which leads on to point three. The third point for me was on challenging those limiting beliefs of what actually is possible. As Jeff said, everything is possible. It might not be probable, but it is possible. Hard work and commitment is what makes it possible. But why not you? Why not apply to those amazing companies you've been thinking about? Why not you having that unbelievable career? Other people have them, and they have the job that you love and would love to get. They're not different to you. Yes, it might seem scary to go for it, but face your fears and do it anyway. With the advice that my guests have given over the previous 34 episodes, you can make achieving any job possible. So there you go. Episode 34 finished. As I mentioned, I'm a big fan of Jeff and his work. I recently saw his new play, which is called The Pyramid Text, which has been turned also into an award-winning film. If you get the chance to see it on stage or on screen, go and see it. You won't be disappointed. Also check out his podcast, Jeff Thompson Inspired, which is linked to in the show notes. And if you've enjoyed the show today, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. It helps new listeners to find the show and it does put a big smile on my face when I see reviews coming in. Now do join us next week when we discuss numerical tests, verbal tests and every other psychometric test you can think of. I tell you now, it's a goodie. I hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next week. <laughs>